And I'm going to read again verse 9. Give, therefore, thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this thy so great a people? Father, we thank you so much for the worship of God, the privilege we all have once again to come to gather in your name to sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs. The singing, the prayers, the greeting, the communion, the offering, all that has been with you in mind as we rehearse your presence with us this morning. And now we come to the matter of the will. May our worship continue in will worship, not our will, but thine be done. May your word serve as a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our pathway. Help us not to just be hearers of your word this morning, but doers also. And as always, may the words of my mouth, the meditation that is in my heart, may it be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, for you are my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Wisdom and Solomon's prayer for it. There's certainly a distinction between wisdom and knowledge. When we think of knowledge, we often think of any familiarity, awareness, or understanding of someone or something. A familiarity an awareness, an understanding of someone or something. Now that's what generally when we think of knowledge and what it is. Wisdom, however, is the ability to think and act using that knowledge in experience, and understanding as it applies to judgment, compassion, benevolence. The ability to be able to act using that knowledge. I really believe that we have a lot of smart people. But what we need is wise people. Paul says that there is a tendency when I just have knowledge for that knowledge to puff me up. That I take pride in all the things that I know. And so I get what we would call the big head. Inflated head because of the knowledge that I have, particularly if I know a lot of things. The Greeks in the New Testament, when Paul would run on them, they actually took great pride in what they would call Sophia. Sophia is the great Greek word for wisdom. And so they spent their times, they spent their days trying to understand and find some new thing. And they would say, Sophia. Paul, in writing to the Corinthians about this Sophia and the pride, so much and so that they thought that the gospel preaching was foolishness. He says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, Foolishness, but to us who are saved, it is the power of God. He says that it is this worldly wisdom that the Greeks were not able, however, to find God, which made it then subpar to the wisdom 
of God, but they took great pride in Sophia. I found it interesting that in October, excuse me, in February in uh, 2016, at the Hanson Robotics, a Hong Kong-based robotic company, unleashed what is known as, or who is known as, Sophia. And Sophia is the humanoid robot. And she now, for the first time ever, in October 2017, has been given by the Saudi Arabian government personhood. Personhood. And the European Parliament is moving so that there can actually be personhood status applied to robotics and artificial intelligence. Can you imagine? Sophia, do a study on it. Once again, the same pride of the Greeks is the same pride that we're seeing. I'm all for advancement in robotics and thank God for all that is happening, innovation, and, and yet, we have to be careful of this pride. What we find is, though, is that Solomon, in a prayer, is going to ask God for wisdom. Ask God for understanding and discernment. Look at the text, starting in verse 1. We see that Solomon has an affinity to the Egyptians. And Solomon made affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had made an end of building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall of Jerusalem round about. The word affinity uh, simply means relationship, not by blood, but by marriage. And so Solomon had an affinity with the North Africans and he took a wife from Pharaoh and through marriage established relationship, not by blood, but through marriage. Uh, there is a tradition today that is based upon not only this relationship, but also the relationship that we see in chapter 10, where the Queen of Sheba, Sheba is a location in Ethiopia, has come to Solomon and she wants to hear this great wisdom that he possesses. These Ethiopians and the North African connection is now, right now, today, there was a Hebrew from Ethiopian who was killed by police. And so right now, Israel is on the verge of civil unrest because of this. Our own country is experiencing what we have been called Hebrew Israelites. These individuals who feel that they are related, you see, by blood. But what we see here, it is an affinity, not by blood, but through marital relationship. My answer always is to those who are struggling in this area that we all can have a relationship by blood with Abraham through Jesus Christ. And that is what a real relationship with Israel, with Abraham. It is by Jesus' blood where Paul, writing to the Galatians, lets us know that the gospel was preached to Abraham when he says that I will bless them that bless thee, I will curse them that curse thee, but in thee all nations of the earth will be blessed. The whole ethnos of Matthew 28, God wants all people groups to be saved. And I am blessed in that, in Father Abraham, through Christ, who was of the seed of Abraham, the seed of David. 
You'll notice in verse 2 that the people only, they sacrifice in the high places. You'll see that in verse 2, only the people sacrifice in the high places because there was no house built into the name of the Lord unto those days. In other words, there was no central place of worship. The people worshiped in the high places. Leviticus 17 warns Israel of the dangers of worshiping in the high places because it is in the high places that there was idol worship. And so Israel would be drawn to the high places and uh, there would be always this desire, this drawing to worship the idols. In fact, in Leviticus 17, it actually says that when you slay those sacrifices outside of Jerusalem, make sure you bring them to the, the area where the tabernacle is. Because if you don't, the tendency will be to worship the demons or worship the devils or to worship the idols. What is amazing is Gibeah to where Solomon would go is where the tabernacle was located. And so you'll see a distinction in the text between the high places and the great high place. Verse 2, only the people sacrificed in high places because there was no house built unto the name of the Lord unto those days and Solomon loved the Lord walking in the status of David his father only he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places and the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there for that was the great high place a thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer unto the altar and so this great high place was where the tabernacle was located in Gibeon. And so we find that Solomon goes to the high places and he worshiped. But the text says that he loved the Lord in verse 3. He, he walked in the statues of David. He sacrificed in the high places and he sacrificed in the great high place where the tabernacle that was built by Moses and the worship and the practice of the burnt offerings. It was while he was at Gibeon that the Lord appears to Solomon in a dream. In verse 5, in Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, ask what I shall give thee. Wow. What a request. Ask what I shall give you. What amazing requests for someone who, according to Ephesians, is able to do exceedingly abundantly above everything I could ask or everything I could think. So often we treat God like a genie. But I heard that and saw someone demonstrate that this is not this. There is a difference. Uh, but God has the ability to do whatever I ask, whatever I'm thinking. And so he says to Solomon, you ask me. And whatever you ask, I, I have the ability to grant your request. Uh, you and I, again, are reminded to ask and to Seek and to knock, all these are action words that uh, are steps of faith that uh, when I ask, I'll receive, when I seek, I'll find, when I knock, the door will be open to me in proportion to what is good for me. And who best to know what's good for me than God? So he says, if a father asks his son for fish, he's He's not going to give him a stone, ask him for uh, br bread. He won't give him a stone. If he asks for fish, he won't give him a serpent because the father knows what's best for me. But anytime I'm asking, anytime you go, any prayer meeting you go to and you ask God in your private devotional life, when you're sitting down and you're praying and you're asking God for something, remember, this is a step of faith. And, and this is what God is looking for. All the miracles in the, in the Gospels, he said, when he saw their faith, when he saw their faith, when he saw their faith, when he saw their faith. Not that we dictate to God, 
But God knows what's best for me. He knows what's best for you. So he's not going to give me everything I ask. But he can do everything I ask. And isn't that wonderful to go in faith knowing that you have a person that if I ask him, whatever I ask him, that is not inconsistent with his character or his word, he's able to give to me. So he says to Solomon, ask me. Just ask. And I'll give to you. What is amazing about this is that Solomon first then gives the history of his father. Now we need to then go back and think about his father because the first thing he's going to say is that you have, Solomon said in verse 6, thou hast shown unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy. So who is Solomon? Solomon is the other son of Bathsheba. He would have known the story of his father and the adultery that was committed because remember he lost a brother in death because of his father's sin. And so he says to God that thou hast shown unto thy servant David my father Great mercy. According as he has walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee, and thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him, a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Having the knowledge and the understanding of what went on between his dad and his mom? Knowing that her husband was killed because of his father. Knowing that his brother was, died because of what David did. The consequences of all of that. Knowing this and... And, and being part, and your mother is the one who committed the act with your father. But yet, God is merciful. God is so merciful, God is so kind that he has allowed for David's son to sit on the throne of Israel. Aren't you glad for God's mercy and kindness in your life? I'm so glad that God does not give me what I deserve. That's his mercy. And when God gives me what I don't deserve, that's his grace. And the Bible tells me that every day, every new morning, I got new mercies I see you. I'm so thankful that he pardons me. He pardons you. And he's just kind to you and to me. I don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. But as Evie here, God says, here. I'm giving you this. Solomon understands where he sits and the great responsibility that he has. And, and that's where he begins. Verse 7, he says, and now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child, and I know not how to go out or come in. The going out and the coming in is simply a phrase that he has not been able to lead and guide the people. When you wanted to see the king's leadership, it was always going out and coming in. Lord, bless my going out and my coming in. It is, just, it is, a, it is how the people would examine the, the king. They, they watched his going out and how he came in. He went out and he came in. He went out and he came in. And years and years of that is how he developed his reputation. Solomon simply says that I'm still young. I'm a little child. We don't know how old he was. But he says I'm a little child, which could mean he could have been as old as 20 years old. But what he's saying is I'm young and I have not yet learned how to be able to go out and come in before these people. 
I don't know what it means to be an example to them. What a, what a tremendous responsibility. Because he says that, that these are the people in verse 8 that, that you have chosen. These are great people. These are, these are the people of God. What, what an awesome responsibility that you have the responsibility to lead the people that God has chosen. Or would be like, like the parenting. What, what an awesome responsibility, parenting. What, what an awesome responsibility to be a pastor. What, what an awesome responsibility to be a leader of people. And the best thing that they have, the reality of what they have is your example to watch your going out and your coming in. In other words, looking at your life to see if your life is consistent with what you say. How awesome is that? How, what, what a responsibility that is. And he understands it as a young person. Timothy knew the same thing. Timothy understood the, the responsibility of being, being a young person. And, and Paul tells him, be an example. Live your life, and your life lived among the people will be the model. And so he says, understanding the position. I need mean, Verse 9, give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge the people that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great people? I need wisdom. I need understanding. I need discernment because, Lord, these are your people. And I'm the king, and I'm responsible for going out in front of them. I am supposed to be leading them. I lead them in, I lead them out. I need wisdom. Any leader who has a sense of the responsibility understands that, that you need more than what you have. If you're a manager today, if you're a supervisor today, if you're a father today, if you're a mother today, if you're a grandparent today, you, 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 you have the responsibility of your children's children. If you're a pastor today, if you're a leader in the church, and, and, and what you, you, you understand that, that the task is bigger than what you have. And you want to lead them in the right way. So you need wisdom. Give it to me, Lord. That's, that's what I need. I need to be able to have your wisdom because I'm going to have to make judgment and I'm going to have to discern what is good and what is bad. So I need, I need wisdom. And this pleased the Lord. Verse 10, and the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing and God said unto him, because thou hast asked this thing and has not asked for thyself long life, neither riches, nor the life of your enemies, but you've asked for understanding and discernment. Remember, he could have asked for anything. And God was able to do it. I heard someone said that it, that, 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 that the genie came to them and said, you got one witch, and I'll grant it. The person said, three more wishes. <laughs> you got an opportunity to ask God, and God has already said, I will do it. But what he was pleased with, you didn't ask for long life, that was not the first thing that came. You, you didn't ask for, for wealth. You didn't even ask to give you victory over the enemies. What, what you asked for was understanding, discernment for my people. 
So, behold, I've done according to thy word. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any rise like unto thee. People would come from all over the world to hear the wisdom of Solomon. We see examples of the two mothers who claimed the child was theirs. And what did he say? Cut the child in half and give each a half. And the one who was not the mother said, okay. But the mother said, no, let her have the child. I would rather her have the child than cut the child in half. Solomon said, that's the mother. That's the kind of wisdom that he had. God said, you didn't ask for these things, but I'm going to give them to you anyway. Verse 13, and I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all the days. And if thou will walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as the father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. And Solomon awoke. And behold, it was a dream, and he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and offered peace offerings and made a feast to all his people. God was pleased with what Solomon's request to ask for wisdom. We benefit from Solomon's wisdom in the book of Proverbs. Some of you have committed yourself to one every day in those months, 30, 31 days, a proverb a day. You've committed yourself. You can, you can hear and you can see the wisdom. He says in Proverbs 2 and verse 6 that, that this wisdom, it comes from the Lord. God is the one who gives the wisdom. God is the one who would allow you to see things, to see life from God's perspective. It is the highest wisdom. It is higher than any wisdom of the world is to be able to see things from God's perspective. Solomon says that this wisdom, it comes from the Lord. Proverbs 2 and verse 6, it, it comes from the Lord. Proverbs 3 and verse 19 reminds us how, how God, through wisdom, has made this universe. We every day can look and glean at the heavens and, and look at nature and and just see how things are going in Proverbs 2, 3, 19. He says, Jehovah by wisdom has founded the earth. And by understanding, he has established the heavens. Just to be able to see the transition of the trees is amazing. The wisdom of planting a seed and, and allowing that seed to grow. Some of us have planted gardens already and and we're seeing things starting to happen. The wisdom in all of that. The fact that, that when you look in the mirror, you look at your, yourself. And when you get past that, you, boy, I look good today. You, you realize that, that Psalm says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. That I can see, I, I can smell, I can touch, I can... I can breathe all, all the, boy, God is wise just by looking. Uh, Jeremiah 10 and, and verse 12, Jeremiah 10 and verse 12 also is a reminder that every day we can see the wisdom of God. It's all around us. It's, it's ever before us. We can observe this, this high, this great wisdom. He hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom. And hath stretched out the heavens by discretion. When I look up in the heavens and I, 
see the sun, the moon, and the stars. What, what kind of wisdom allows for the sun to be positioned right in the right place? The moon right in the right place. The stars right in the right places. The, to be able to tell the sea, stop here, don't go no further than this. The wisdom in all of that. Well, that's the wisdom I want. That's the wisdom that we should be, we should be praying for. I, I'm speaking this morning to, to those who perhaps are, again, are managers and and, and you are supervisors on your job. You have just been given enormous responsibility over people. The best thing you can do is to ask God for wisdom. Lord, give me a discerning heart to be able to lead these people. If you are a parent this morning, you now have come to the realization, the awesomeness of the responsibility of leading and guiding your children. Going out before them and, and coming in, the going out and the coming in. That means they're, they're looking at your life as an example. I realize that the task of parenting is, is, is bigger than what I have. So I need wisdom. I need discernment. Those young people who are preparing to go off to school and, and you're going to have a new setting, you're going to be in a new environment, you're going to have a new roommate, the person you, you, you don't know, you, you don't know what their life is like, only from what they're presented. You, you don't know what's ahead of you. You don't know what's coming behind you. You're going to have to make decisions now for the first time without your parents. Guess what? You need to be praying and asking God for wisdom, discernment. Lord, give me understanding as I go off to college, as I go off to school, as I, as I go to the military, whatever, whatever God is leading you to, you need to ask him for, for wisdom. Thank God for our grandparents. So we're often taking care of our children. We, we've gone through ours. We, we, we were planning all of these things for our life. And lo and behold, now I have my children's children. And times are different now. Things are faster now. I've slowed down. I need wisdom. I need discernment. In the context of trials and tribulation, James chapter 1 and verse 5. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse trials. And the trial is working something out in my life, in your life. But, but in the midst of the trial, I, I, I need wisdom. And guess what? God has promised to give me a, a Solomon experience. James 1 and verse 5, a Solomon experience that he says, but if any of you what? Lack wisdom. Let him ask of God. Who giveth to all liberally. And abradeth not. And it shall be given him. Today we're acquiring a lot of knowledge. There's so many things that are at our disposal that are true and not true. You can't trust everything from social media as the gospel truth. And yet I'm often left with still a decision that is in front of me. The worldly wisdom is not the highest wisdom. The highest wisdom is the wisdom of God. It is in the wisdom of God that I can see things from his perspective 
based on the wisdom that he has given to me, and I'll have discernment, understanding, practical knowledge to do those things. Lord, I look at the heavens, you're wise. I look at creation and I could see the wisdom I've gone to the ant, like you said, and watched the ant. Oh, you're so wise, God. And so I need wisdom for my life. I've got the responsibility of people. You might have parents now. You need wisdom. God said, ask me. Just like he says to Solomon. You ask me, and I'll give it to you. Father, we thank you so much for your word today. Thank you for Solomon's prayer for wisdom. You gave him a discerning heart, understanding like no other. The fact that he asked for wisdom to lead your people was pleasing to you. As a pastor, I'm asking you for wisdom to lead your people, to lead my wife, and my family. I'm praying for my family, my sons and their responsibilities as fathers, for wisdom. I'm praying for my brothers and sisters in Christ here. Those in the church that have positions of leadership and are deacons and trustees and ushers and others, Lord, our deaconess. All of those who, who, who have the responsibility of leading people, your people, Oh, we pray and commit ourselves to wisdom, your wisdom. I'm praying for those who have responsibilities outside, parents now, new parents. They have children looking at them and looking at the world and, and not knowing what will become of these children. They need wisdom, Father. I'm praying for our students, our young people who are, who are going off to college for the first time. They, they're going to be leaving home. They're going to be in new cities, new environments, and there'll be new people. Oh, may they pray for wisdom, godly wisdom, and discernment, and understanding heart. Praying for those managers in our church and supervisors and they have the responsibility in their workplace over people. The people are counting on them to make decisions. They're watching, they're going out and they're coming in. Give, give those managers and those supervisors, the men and women, the, the wisdom that is needed to, to lead and to guide. I pray for our nation the leaders that we have elected, that they may begin to see the importance of godly wisdom, godly discernment, godly understanding. Oh God, help us in this area of our life. Thank you for Solomon. Thank you for his request. May it put things in perspective for ourselves that you said, seek first the kingdom and your righteousness and all the other things will be added just like you did with Solomon. Bless us, encourage us from the word of God this morning, we pray in Jesus name. Amen.